listening to the White Wall Sessions Radio. Welcome to the White Wall Sessions Radio. I'm your host, Dan Schaefer. On tonight's show, part two of The Aircraft, Ryan Joseph Anderson, and Almighty American. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter by searching The White Wall Sessions. We are now accepting submissions for Season 8. To apply, visit whitewallsessions.com. The White Wall Sessions would like to thank these fine sponsors for their support. Last Stop CD Shop, Bell Incorporated, Workplace IT Management, J. Rick Luthery, The University Center, Screen Flare, The Pink Moon Room, Club David, Great Outdoor Store, Local Branded Convenience Stores, Minuteman Press, Vishnu Bunny Tattoo and Piercing, and South Dakota Friends of Traditional Music. The Aircraft is a four-piece group of musical masterminds who gave their all to their season six session and wowed the audience. All right, we're the Aircraft, and this is St. Paul. The Aircraft is Joseph Bartles, vocals, guitar, bass guitar, and keyboards, Henry Reinders, vocals, guitar, bass guitar, Kyle Gaines, drums, and Caleb Smith, bass guitar.
you know, you guys are pretty young. We're early 20s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. We're both 21. These guys are 20. I'm actually 22. You're 22? <laughs> <laughs> this is new stuff. Happy birthday. He's the old. He's the, the <laughs> oldest. Not give him anything. <laughs> and, you know, this isn't just noise rock music y'all are making. This has got texture and melodies and, and sort of, um, you know, interesting pieces and parts. Where does that come from? Who's writing the songs and, and how you get that feel, that well, sound? Yeah, Joe and I write the songs. Um, I don't know. A lot of the music we listen to is rather dynamic, so we kind of enjoy that. So we try to pull that into as much of our music as we can. So yeah. I'm the Districts, big, big influence, Zeppelin, uh, yeah, Beatles, Blackies. Yeah. But also Henry and I, as like the songwriters, we listen to way different music. Yeah, so that, so that than each other. It, yeah, it brings each in. Other, yeah. You know, different flavors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can tell. Do you co-write or do you individually write? We've yeah. co-written one song, and that was the one diving board. <laughs> <laughs> Which is... See if that one makes it. Um, <laughs> and you're still friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so we kind of get the the first 50% done and then bring it to the band, and then it gets finished. Yeah. Well, what does it start as? Is it just sort of a one four <laughs> five with a melody and then all the parts come, or do you kind of write those in individually? Yeah. Well, if it's Henry, it's a, uh, <laughs> oh, guys, I I discovered the grooviest lick. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, every lick. Happens. Yeah, and, and then we have to figure out the chords, and then, you know, maybe yeah. maybe he's got some lyrics with him. If it's Joe, he's a lot more uh, particular. So it's yeah. more, uh, it's yeah. a... Kind of have a plan There's a lot already. more to it. There's a lot, yeah. Not that, it's just... Two different it's ways of different. writing songs. <laughs> it's really fun to kind of take them and then, okay, we transformed it from Henry or Joe's song to the aircraft song. Yeah. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, y'all are, I got to say, really good at your at your instruments. You know, let's start with Thank the you. drums. You Solid drumming back there. Thank You've been you, playing man. a while? Thank you. No, I've, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I've not been. I, uh, actually, it was my kind of senior year of high school where they were like, hey, we need some drummer, uh, you know, for... Just like a chapel sort of setting, and I was like, I can kind of keep a beat like on a desk. <laughs> <laughs> it was a small school, and uh, yeah, so I just kind of hopped on there and you know, hope for the best. And uh, slowly kind of getting into college, um, I just had some people kind of pushing me to you know, like kind of just keep pursuing drumming a little bit, and just a lot of hours, a lot of YouTube university. I don't, I don't know, nothing special, <laughs> but it's been a ton of fun. I, I enjoy it. Well, a it's lot. working, yeah. thank it's you, working. thank you. And the other guys, I've got to say, Fender is well represented here. We got yeah. a P bass. We like to. We had a Jazz yeah. Master. We had a Tele and a Strat. Yeah. Um, those you guys save up for those, or do they pass down to you? Uh, I kind of built mine, but save save uh, up for them. Yeah, I just put them together myself. Yeah. Yeah. More fun that way sometimes. The P bass is actually Henry's. My uh, own yeah. personal bass is. Uh, so it's the Telly. I, yeah, I oh. play in the jazz band, so I have a jazz bass, <laughs> and it's actually fretless. So it's more of a doesn't suit our style. So I kind of use his for this. Yeah. This yeah. group. But. It's a beauty, though. It's a beauty. Oh yeah, <laughs> love it. She's <laughs> nice. my baby. She's You've nice. been playing bass a long time. You say you played in jazz band. Uh, is that yeah. at Dort or in high school or both? Uh, both. Yeah. So I've been playing since uh, sixth grade. Yeah, and just kind of playing in the jazz band and the pep band, and then I'm now in the orchestra at Dort and playing the jazz band. So, yeah, cool. it's kind of. Important. Well, you, Joe, how long have you been playing? Um, you know, I kind of got a guitar in middle school or something. I don't play it quite <laughs> then, but um, I think during high school I started to, when I started to really enjoy like classic rock, like Zeppelin, and like uh. really picked it up. When when did you start playing keys? Or would you consider your a, yourself to be a guitar player or a key play, keyboard guitar player? player yeah. Yeah. He's player. also a drummer, though. He was kind of the one that, you know, taught me how to, <laughs> not taught me how to drum, but like <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, different grooves and stuff that we're working on. And yeah, it's just been, he's a jack of all trades. Yeah. Master of none. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got some great licks. You know, Thank I mean, that's a great guitar player, great tones, you. you know, you can, you can, hear the tone you guys you know obviously know what good tone is he puts a lot of thought into his tone he's yeah. made like on his pedal board the top row he like he bought in the bottom row yeah i make he pedals made and amps he made his amp and, oh yeah so. that's nice yeah <laughs> when you're writing these songs um how, who are you writing about i mean are they fictional people or are the experiences you guys are 
have been through? I haven't ever really written a song about fictional people, kind of in a, in a sense, you know. But they're mostly about me and my experiences. Mm. Yeah, I mostly me and my experiences. Sometimes there's some just artistic uh, license on. So not all of it's true, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so do you ever play a show and then come back to the door on Monday and someone's looking at you like, that song was about me, wasn't it? <laughs> no, that's never happened. <laughs> no, it's, it's usually like about events less than yeah. people. But <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about recording. Um, you've done some recording now. You're working on, yeah. you guys have a couple EPs? Yeah, we yeah. have two. You can find one. That's a good one. <laughs> Both are on Bandcamp. Both are on Bandcamp. You, you can find everything on Bandcamp. The first one, it was just Henry and I. Yep. That was like two years ago. And we recorded that all ourselves. Covered in the dark, opaque. The blood leaks into your arm. Dangerously.
Coming up after the break, Ryan Joseph Anderson. Listening to the White Wall Sessions Radio. Ryan Joseph Anderson from Chicago, Illinois, made his second appearance on the White Wall Sessions in season six. Ryan is a hard traveling singer songwriter, but when he's not on the road, he's a record producer, a studio musician, and a sideman. All right, here we go. This is a new song called Mine Like Mine. Stones and change Scattered on a poor man's grave Empty pockets knew my name Days of old lang syne My burden over your pride What I earn, babe Is what I lost in time And you were the last one to find Last one to find Hard to ease a mind like mine You're never gonna ease A mind like mine Waxing moons, paper suns, this wasted youth. I thought I'd won in days of old lang syne. Between these curtains and the light, I could show you all the reasons why. All the reasons why. You were the last one to find Last one to find Hard to ease a mind like mine You're never gonna ease A mind like mine But we could run until these bodies drop Keep eyes fixed on some hanging clouds Just lay your bones Beside me now and rest Oh, rest Ashes, stones, and change On the steps we climb to save My twisted grin, your foolish grace In days of old lang syne To be in your arms again all we've held dear And all we never will All we never will And we'll be the last ones to find Last ones to find Hard to ease a mind like mine You're never gonna ease Mind like Never gonna eat. Thank you. Do they take you back to those places, either bad or good? And, yeah, definitely. And do you allow them to take you there, or is it something you have to just set aside? I don't think you can help it. You know, I think it. it if you get into singing, it, you know, if you if you're being honest, it's hard to avoid not, you know, drifting into whatever that emotion or feeling or headspace was. Mm. When you or when you write a song, do you sit down to write a song? And you write it front to back, or do you? Have little bits here and there you assemble later. 
I kind of sit down and just start messing around on the guitar until something hits me, and then I will sing nonsense for a long time and drive Jen absolutely crazy. <laughs> and then, like, a word or a phrase or some, something will come out that I'll start to be able to, like, shape a song around. Mm. Sometimes, like, with the songwriting group we're in, we'll get a prompt or something that I'll be triggered, like, oh, I want to write a song about this thing. But usually that comes later. Usually it's me messing around on the guitar and something comes up. I'm like, sure. oh, I want to follow that. So that group you're involved in with uh, Brian Johannesson, um, an international songwriting, songwriting machine. machine. <laughs> Which is good. Do you ever find yourself, you've got sort of a melody, you've got some guitar stuff going on, you've got some maybe phonics landing where they're supposed to, but you don't know what to write about? Yeah, all the time. That's what's great about it. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, that that's writer's block for me. I'm never. It's never that I don't have, I have, at any given time, I have 100 ideas. But the hardest thing is like, I don't, you know, I have all these musical ideas, but I can't think of what I want to say. And so having prompts for that is huge because it it will force you to sit down and be like, okay, now I can start putting the puzzle together and follow this where it needs to go. So, yeah, that is a really good exercise. You get a song out of that called 54 Hands. Yeah. Which is a very bizarre topic to talk about, but the way you then started put person people to those hands, which this is kind of strange to listen to, I'm sure, but um, <laughs> talk about that song. It was, w- Brian's wife sent the article to a friend of ours, and then it was all, we have to start. This, it's right up my alley for what I like to write songs about. Like, it's haunting <laughs> and weird. And w- when I decided to write a song about it, the thing is like, well, you have 54, you know, these pairs of hands um, found in a, in a bag in the snow on a fishing island in Siberia. And they couldn't figure out where this bag of hands came from, and the theory is that it was from a forensic lab. And that just made it weirder to me, that these, like, severed hands of criminals are sitting in this forensic lab and somebody's haunted by them Mm -hmm. and decides they can't be around it anymore and just, you know, they huck it into the snow. That's what I started thinking. And then as I started writing that, naturally the next thing for me to talk about was like, okay, well, where did these... Like, why are you haunted from it? And the guy's haunted because he keeps thinking about, like, where they're from, who they're connected with, and, yeah, and then that, it just kind of kept following that. That was, that was really amazing. Yeah, so thanks. when you're getting a song like that, excuse me, and it's starting to, I hope you can cut that out. <laughs> oh, burp, good. Oh, we're slow, sorry. We're like, <laughs> um, when you get a song like that and it starts opening up, is that pretty exciting? You just want to keep going until yeah. you finish because you want to know what happens in the end? Yeah, absolutely. Because th- those are the songs, like, I'll, I'll have songs that it takes a year to write, that it's constantly like, I don't know what the next thing, where to go. And songs like that, it, uh, you're almost forced to sit down. I, I wrote too much for that song and had to edit it down mm. kind of immediately. I just kept having ideas and then whittling it down. And that is really exciting. I think that's the most exciting thing when you're writing songs is if something just kind of naturally happens or happens instantly, it's really exciting because you can forget about the year of just like, oh, what, <laughs> you know, what is this line? What's the next, you know, sure. it's grueling. Well, and those ones that don't make it right away. And um, when do you, I mean, do you find a place to stop and then just record it and put it away and maybe you'll get something to add to it later? Yeah, so I teach a songwriting workshop in Chicago, and I tell a lot of people, like, the goal of writing songs isn't always to finish a song. Like, it, it shouldn't always be that you have to, like, have this perfectly polished piece. Sometimes you write something just to get to the next thing. Like, you have to just keep the creative juices flowing. And So there's nothing wrong with not finishing songs. But then the thing that tends to happen with a lot of that stuff is you're working on something else, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh... I have all these little pieces, you know, these orphans behind that I can kind of mine from and glue together and then, you know, finish songs that way, like, you know, a patchwork quilt. Sure. And I do that a lot, a lot, where it's like, oh, these two things fit together. Oh, that's cool. Um, You do some studio work, too. You've produced Brian Johansson's record. Mm -hmm. Do you do a lot of producing? I do a a good amount of producing and, and... I do some like session work on guitar. I love the recording studio. Yeah. 
Where do you do that mainly? It depends. There's a couple places in Chicago that I've worked out of. We work on Brian's records at our friend's studio in Iowa. Um, I, I do a lot of stuff at this place in Chicago called Minball. It just depends mm. what room is right for the project. And so you've got at least two albums. You've got uh, The Weaver's Broom, which yeah. was a great record. Thank and, you. And so is City of Vines. Love those two albums. Thanks. You're working on a new one, though, yeah? I'm working on a new EP. I'm writing an EP for um, me, like acoustic, fingerstyle guitar, and a string quartet. And so when you go to write these albums or you go to produce these albums, is, do you just take the 10 or 12 best songs you have at the time, or do you actually write them in sequence to sort of a collection? Both. Both. Like this, the one I'm working on now, I'm definitely picking the songs that I feel are appropriate for the configuration mm-hmm. that I that I want to do. Like, you know, I don't think 54 Hands is, is I want to play that with like a rock band, mm. but there's some of the other stuff that I think is going to sound really great with a string quartet. So it's kind of like picking and choosing. Sure. Yeah, and, you know, we're in the Last Stop Studios here in the last, under the Last Stop CD shop, and albums are coming back vinyl. And at least the concept of an album or a collection of music in that time and that space for these, for that musician. Um, I think that's important. I mean, well, it can be, you know, scattered can be good, but that it, that's a body of work really that needs to go together and really needs to be listened to at the same, in the same time. Oh, a- absolutely. I think that's the most depressing thing about modern music. This, the Spotify, whatever, is that it kind of killed off that, you know, I, I think some of my favorite albums are things that, like, you know, I'd go buy a record and I'd put it on and I didn't get it, but I had spent money on the record and I was going to listen to it again. And then three times, like, you listen to it three times and then all of a sudden it's your favorite record. Like, you have to spend time with it. And now things are very, it's you know, a song can come on on a record and somebody gets bored yeah. You know, they, the chorus doesn't really hit them the first time, and it's just skip and never revisit it. That's exactly right. I mean, the way you, you've invested that, and you've got this thing, and then you have to dedicate time to it. And I think I think people write songs, the, the machines, you know, writing songs, they have to have all those hooks in it because it has to catch them right away. And you really lose a lot of that depth of a song if you're not writing the whole thing like they used to. I, I think so. Yeah, I mean... And, I, just the art of the album, the way you sequencing it and trying to like set a mood and trying to tell a story. I mean, there really is an art to it. And when it's done well, I think it's the most exciting thing, like to put on a record that's really well thought out, really well sequenced, has something to say, you know, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. So talk about touring. Um, you've got a tour right now with Brian Johansson yeah. and, um, a good bit of dates there. Do you like, I mean, what does touring do for your writing and or music? It's great to meet people. It's great to, to, you know, we tend to play a lot of secondary markets in between cities and stuff. And those, those kind of are my favorite. All of those city lights. Flicker like candle fire And I have no time to be lying awake I know that I've been bitter Come to me sweet now, please Tell me that you're gonna stay here And rock me to sleep All the time I spend Looking with eyes that bend back by the roads of our old country home Keep me outside of your window I've already knocked down your door Just tell me that you're gonna love me a little bit more Oh, I'd pray for the snow See that it all falls so terribly slow And I'd hold on to the road And smile when it all goes It all goes wrong Call me a 
vagabond A pretty boy, a second thought Take me away for a couple of days Tell me that I'm a sinner I already know that I am Tell me that you're gonna find me wherever I land Sessions Radio. Making his debut performance in the White Wall Sessions is Almighty American from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Growing up inspired by the tunes and melodies of his father's generation, Michael Gay has determined to leave his own mark on the music. Almighty American is Michael Gay, guitar and vocals, Andrew Shabilla, guitar, and Matthew Decker on drums. I used to close my eyes and wonder While the radio played Living other people's stories of love Pain and heartbreak They'd sing a beauty so ethereal It couldn't be material Could see myself as someone else in trial for the furthest fall. And I found a home for the jealous. Wish I could follow, but I'm forced to stay. Comes every morning when I wake to the sound of bus brakes and the rumble. I have this dream where I'm riding on some boxcar across the open plains And I sit and watch the sun bedding down upon some mountain range Or will my REM cycle serial ever be I've seen reality get the best of me more times than I'd like to recall. I still got that same old sort of jealous. I wish I could follow, but I'm forced to stay. It comes every morning when I wake to the sound of bus brakes and the rumble of. What is it about Minnesota that makes the producers such great songwriters and or musicians? Um, is that a loaded question? <laughs> maybe. Prince famously said, it, the cold keeps the bad people away. Um, <laughs> and I, I've always thought that was a pretty good you know, summary. But I, I don't know. I think there is something to like 
just how seasonal it is where everybody kind of hunkers down at some point and like just get goes to work and um so i think that the the creative community really benefits from that mm-hmm. um cycle where it's like you want to be working on stuff in the fall and winter so that you can put out something in the spring and then play a bunch of shows in the summertime and then by the time summer's over you're like ready to do it all over again you know so um but yeah when it's just dark and cold everybody gets comp- contemplative and you know so the seasons of minnesota write your schedule for you i think i mean it right. certainly impacts like my creativity and that pro- that process and when i'm productive and when i'm not yeah. in the summertime i keep myself really busy and sometimes i have to be like okay stop and like write and you know so i think there's something too if i can jump in about the midwest that and probably south dakota minnesota included um the people there i think appreciate the balance of like the, the seasons, the weather, the cost of living, whatever it is that uh, people move to Nashville and if they don't like the hustle and the, the bustle of Nashville, they come back and they're like, we will, I want to raise a family, but I also want to keep playing music. So there's a lot of people, there's a lot of really great people in the Minneapolis and yeah. Minnesota music scene that get um, like life outside of music too. So it makes it fun to to do both, to do music and, and it's much more sustainable, I think too, that they figured mm-hmm. out a way to to have a family and, and chase their dreams and kind of do it for a long time and enjoy it. Yeah, I think there can really be a motivational shift with that where you're like, I'm going to do this where it makes sense for me and I can create where it's, you can continue to like maintain the same level of creativity instead of like going super hard for a long time and sure. just kind of roasting yourself and burning out. So, yeah. Yeah, you can sort of start as a hobby and grow it as a hobby and, and kind of balance that until wherever you want to go if you want to make it a living or not right it just mm-hmm. works yeah interesting um so let's talk about the guitar tone <laughs> yours. Now I want to talk about your drum. Go how much time you got <laughs> <laughs> where uh how long have you been playing uh, i started actually michael and i we were in a, a ska band in sixth sixth seventh grade maybe Middle in school, rochester yeah. so that's where it all began thankfully it's not there anymore <laughs> um but yeah i was 12 or 13 so it's been in rochester then yes ska band yeah yeah <laughs> yep so i've been playing for 15 or 16 years or so yeah so and uh, your instruments and your amp got to be older than you right yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> the amp is i think just turned 50 which is pretty remarkable that Fender made gear that uh, is still able to be played, <laughs> yeah. you know, 50 years later. Yeah. Is the tone of those, I mean, how did you come to those? I mean, were they handed down to you or did you go after those? Man, I have gotten into the the rabbit hole of gear over the last five or six years. And I have a little side business building um, switches and units for people's pedal boards. So I've kind of like fully immersed in the gear. But I, I think I got that one on Reverb. We got a good deal on it, and it had some issues. And there's a great amp tech in Minneapolis, um, Jeff Fowler, who fixed it up. And yeah. um, so that's been my go-to gigging amp for for this group. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. And Matt, let's talk about your drums. So, you know, it, it, I, I love the drum style where it's just enough to make the song work. You know. Yeah. And that you were really hitting that. Uh, have you been playing a long time? Uh, yeah, I, I've been playing drums similar to Andrew since some like fifth grade. Um, but my background like then was orchestral, you know, symphonic band and stuff like that. And then, so I didn't play the kid until probably college. That setup seems to work for pretty much anything. So yeah, just a little bit of flavor adjustment. It's easy to fit in the car too. Yeah. It works great for that. <laughs> it's a compact Oops. setup. We, we opened Mid-size the back SUV. door and everything was perfectly lined. I don't know how you got all that in there, but it, it worked. Tetris. <laughs> Tetris. A lot of Tetris. But- <laughs> North Shore. You shook around the North Shore living in a suitcase where the air is fresh. We're at home. I got granite for a table and
Well, thank you. The White Wall Sessions is recorded at Last Stop Studios in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and is produced by Spectrum Films Incorporated. Executive producers are Jeff Zuger, Doug Taylor, Greggy Johnson, and Jay Fishback. Head of broadcast is David Palmer. Associate producer is Mike Yeager. The White Wall Sessions Radio is produced and edited by Jeff Zuger. Audio recording and mixing by Kevin Phipps, Chad Conrad, August Ogren, and David Palmer. Scheduling and artist relations, Tom Eisner. Be sure to join us again next week, same time, same place. You are listening to the White Wall Sessions Radio.